technology has to be an enhancement or an enabler or an amplifier, not the lead. So we're, we're very clear in our motto that we're not adopting technology for technology's sake. Uh, we also make it uh, on demand, right? So you can go through the gallery, gallery completely with a physical experience, which is non-tech. Welcome to the Make Tomorrow podcast, where we venture into the heart of innovation, technology, and the future of business. I'm your host, Tristan Sternson, Senior Partner and Global Co-Lead of NCS Next. In this inspiring episode of Make Tomorrow Inclusive, we are delighted to welcome Chris Lee, the Assistant Chief Executive of the National Gallery Singapore. The gallery has undergone a radical redesign, introducing a new multimodal decentralized ticketing system and a seamless museum experience. Welcome to the episode, Chris. It's Thanks, nice Tristan. to have you here. Yeah. So before we get started, I just want to know a little bit about your background and your personal journey into the world of art and technology and how that converged together. It's a little bit accidental, uh, to be honest. I never planned to be uh, in the art sector or with the museum. A short stint has turned up to be almost an eight year uh, stint with the gallery. Um, my background uh, before the gallery was really largely in multinational corporations, uh, starting in consulting and then uh, move, moving over to marketing, uh, where I started in consumer goods uh, with uh, packaged goods and then evolved into a tech um, sector with companies like Philips, Sony Ericsson, HP, and then most recently with EMC, a B2B data center cloud computing uh, company that was later acquired by Dell. It feels a bit full circle actually, because I started in tech consulting and now end up with uh, you know, uh, tech as part of my portfolio, but of course infused with art, uh, where interestingly, you don't see the intuitive linkage, but I guess a lot of what we do in marketing is in the creative services and related to visual design and art space. So when I left EMC, I was taking a break um, and just checking things out, you know, thinking about how I could give back uh, to local regional organizations with my multinational experience. I missed the whole launch of the gallery in Singapore. I drew, drove across this building and thought, hey, that's a fantastic looking uh, <laughs> building. Let's go in, I said to my wife. And it was 6 p.m. I remember that day. The museum closes at 7. So we only had one hour, went in, poked, poked around, liked what we saw. And then two weeks later, interestingly, the recruiter called and said, hey, you said you were looking for something different. How about this? I was like, well, okay, you met the brief on different. <laughs> uh, what am I going to do for them? And, and yeah, eight years later, I'm here uh, doing what I'm doing. Um, I have to give credit to the gallery for being open-minded to take somebody without an arts background and also for allowing my portfolio to grow from originally uh, the chief marketing officer to now uh, running a few functions that we've uh, you know, innovatively stitched together uh, to look at the end-to-end -end journey, which includes uh, tech uh, very much these days. Now, I, I love that accidental. I think a lot of my career has been accidental. Yeah. I, I started as a trying to get into business consulting yeah. and got thrown into databases and programming. Uh -oh. and that's nice. how my career went and uh, yeah. that accidental, sometimes it's intentional, you just don't know about yeah. it. Yeah, right? you just go with it. Right? <laughs> you just go with it, exactly. Yeah. Um, did you have a passion for art before you got into it? Not, not in the way that I'm exposed to now. Yeah. I mean, I like, uh, you know, creative products, uh, creativity, you know, you, you watch the odd art film here and there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but, but never into actually uh, in depth into art history and you know studying uh, the work of artists in more detail but I must say it's not something difficult to get into mm -hmm. um, and especially at the gallery you know having the privilege of our curators who have all the knowledge that they are happy to share and impart and you get your personal tour guide you know mm -hmm. and a sneak preview of what they do uh, it's easy it's easy to get into it and the sector is now much more open uh, to people from outside of the sector, which is a great thing. Have you had any advice from someone as you've gone through your career that has really changed the way that you've thought about things? Yeah, you know, it's, I don't know if this is accidental or, or <laughs> purposeful, uh, but a lot of my jobs have entailed change and transformation, right? Even though it's in marketing, it's about transforming a marketing function, transforming how marketing clicks into a business. And one of my coaches, um, 
midway through my career because I was driving a lot of change. And at times, driving change can be challenging mm -hmm. and frustrating. Um, and he said that, you know, if you want to drive change in others, first start with a change in yourself. Good advice. And yeah. I was like, what do you mean by that? It's the others who need to change. Why are you asking <laughs> me to change? Uh, but as you, as you go through it and you look at how people re react to you when you introduce new ideas, it, it really is true. Yeah. You know, because you have to look at what might be intuitive to you and how it might not be intuitive to somebody else. Yeah. Obviously, we've got a closer you know, a partnership between NCS and yes. the National Gallery. And we've been able to be at the forefront of seeing how a lot of this has changed. But I'm just interested from a customer experience. Talk a little bit about the uh, seamless ticketing in the Gallery Anywhere and how that has transformed the National Gallery. Sure. Yeah. I guess uh, one of those projects, the seamless ticketing project, uh, we started on it uh, just before COVID. And it started pretty simply. In fact, I wasn't even supposed to be involved in it. It was a tech project. Started in the IT visitor experience team and the brief was pretty simple. Uh, we felt like we needed to upgrade our ticketing platform. And then they asked me to get involved to kind of bring a audience-centric customer experience uh, approach to things. And before you know it, as we got into it, we went from seamless ticketing to looking at revamping the entire visitor experience in the museum, uh, which was, again, fantastic that the gallery is so open-minded that uh, from something very small, uh, we managed to enlarge it. So we looked at the end-to-end -end visitor experience um, where we considered the physical building infrastructure and experience, but also how to uh, integrate digital technology into it in a sensible way that is making sense for our visitors and our audiences, not tech for tech's sake. Uh, so we looked at how people found us uh, before they come to the museum, how they experience us when they arrive at the museum. It's a big museum, 64,000 square meters of space between the two National Monument buildings, how they experience the art, uh, what they do when they're in the building, but also what they do after they leave. Uh, and ticketing was just one small part of it, uh, but it was creating quite a bit of friction uh, because as a big, big building, um, we have seven entrances and exits. Uh, and the big debate was, hey, you know, should we keep the beauty of the building and the entrance and exits, or should we do like most museums, funnel them through one central entrance and funnel them out another one? And we thought we didn't want to do that. Um, yeah. And the original design was that wherever you came in from the seven entrances or exits, you had to go to the basement to get your tickets. Mm. Uh, but there were leakages, right? You could bypass that and end up on the third or the fourth floor, and then you'd be told to go all the way back down to the basement. Yep. Uh, so we, we, we looked at that carefully and we said, hey, it doesn't make sense. Let's make what is intuitive sense to the visitor and let's prioritize that. Let's not let our own internal thinking and technology drive how the visitors experience us. Yep. So we took a brave call to say, let's remove the centralized ticketing um, counters at the basement and let's decentralize everything. So technically you can buy a ticket anywhere you come in. Uh, with mobile technology. And that's where the multimodal um, uh, design came in because we have a large range of audiences from the very young to the very old, from the tech savvy to the non-tech savvy. We couldn't just go overnight from a physical counter experience to just full self-service uh, yep. using mobile devices or uh, electronic devices. So we got a mix of both. It took us about two and a half, three years to construct that in the middle of COVID. So we went from, hey, let's have some self-service touchscreen kiosks to the government saying no touchscreen. So we had to switch over to mobile, more personal mobile devices yeah. and then switch back when the COVID restrictions were lifted. Yeah. Right? So that, well, that was one big project. Uh, the other thing we did was to fundamentally rethink how people uh, came in and had to engage with buying a ticket. We noticed a lot of visitors spending at least 10 to 20 minutes figuring out which ticket to buy to see which type of exhibitions. And so we turned that on its head. We said, can we have an approach where they don't have to worry about our ticket classes and where they want to go, but give them a, a, a search uh, ability to say, hey, here are all the things that are going on at the gallery. You pick and choose what you like, almost build an itinerary for yourself, mm -hmm. and we will tell you what tickets you need to get. 
And we even curated some of these itineraries called Art Journeys, where if you've got one hour in the gallery, here's what we recommend. If you've got two hours, here's what you, we recommend. If you're here for the gram, here are all the spots that you should go to. You know, if you're an art lover, here's a recommended itinerary. So to take the whole friction out and not have people worry about their tickets, but think about what they want to experience. Yeah, to be able to turn up somewhere and have something that's already curated for you. Yeah. And the effectiveness so you see what you want to see because it's been curated and suggested that's a a time saving and b an unbelievable experience yeah and accessibility and inclusivity yep. as well right we're talking yep. about making tomorrow inclusive our tagline with ncs yep. uh, that lowers down the barrier you know you don't have to have a degree in art history yep. uh, because the itinerary kind of guides you uh, through it so that was uh, the seamless experience project gallery anywhere was almost the opposite uh, was in the middle of COVID mm -hmm. uh, and we had to rapidly digitize everything that we needed because within weeks we were told that you know the, the museum will go into a lockdown and people can't come in so we were tested in how we could take all of our physical assets and our digital assets and put it all in one place and importantly make it uh, easy for somebody to search download experience so it came up very simple categories like listen play engage Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that taught us a lot in terms of how, without drawing people into the physical museum, how we can engage mm -hmm. online. Uh, and that's inspired all of the work that we're doing on our website now. And interestingly, pre-COVID to post-COVID, our website has now almost tripled in terms of number of visitors because we learned how to engage with them uh, online as much as we uh, were, you know, um, skilled in doing that physically in person. Have you found that journey mapping from that? So people who have gone online during COVID to now coming in has, has increased? In the later stages of COVID, I think like everybody, uh, our visitors face digital fatigue. You know, they were tired of looking <laughs> at screens yeah. and they were coming back physically, yeah. you know, and, and so we had to rebalance. So some of our large scale festivals that we managed to successfully switch over to, you know, uh, a fully digital experience. We had to peel back to a hybrid where it was physical and digital. Yep. And that's kind of where we're landing with a digital experience yep. where it's not one or the other, it's both. Yep. You know, how do you come in for a physical experience but continuing to extend that uh, with digital, either on site or after you go home? Yeah, I love the word digital. <laughs> I, I think it's fantastic because to me, it's also about, you talk about accessibility and inclusiveness. Yeah. Um, it's providing someone something that they haven't done before yeah. in the digital world, which is really simple and easy and quick. Yes. And then bring them into the physical world. Yeah. And it's great for the human being to be Absolutely. able to physically immerse yeah. themselves. Yeah. Wellness become, became a big uh, concern during COVID, right? Yeah. Mental wellness, uh, well being, mindfulness. Uh, and that was another thing that we kind of started. And this is non-tech-led innovation. Yep. We realized that art had a significant role to play in wellness. You know, yep. just getting people to come in, unwind, decompress, engage with the art physically and not with screens. Yep. Uh, it has a, you know, calming mindfulness uh, effect. Yep. Um, and we, we kind of knew that nascently uh, before COVID. We saw a lot of lawyers from Supreme Court behind our building come in during lunchtime just to get reprieve. Yep. Um, and we realized that that actually could uh, apply to a wider spectrum of people. We work with the hospitals during COVID for the frontline uh, healthcare workers uh, to actually create programs for them, a slow art program where uh, it started virtual, where we could get people online looking at a piece of art and really through the mindfulness, breathing exercises, focus on that one piece of art and analyze what was being uh, depicted in the artwork. And that had a very um, soothing uh, reprieve type of uh, effect. Yeah. Um, and then we did it uh, physically once the restrictions were lifted. You yeah. Know? So yeah, many uh, wonderful things that came out of COVID. You've hit on a passion of mine, which is wellness. So <laughs> that's yeah. a really, really big area and something I'm personally passionate about, preventative health and, and wellness. And um, I love the being able to disengage from technology. And I know mm. this is a technology part. Yeah. Technology is a really important part of our life, but sometimes we need to, we need to turn off. Right? Yeah. 
technology is really important within the gallery as well to give people the experience for the for the novices that are coming through for the first time. You're using a lot of technology like augmented reality and stuff yes, to kind yes. of explain art. Yep. Yeah. And are there sections where it's like, no, this just has to be separate. There's no technology allowed. Yeah. You know, put your phone down sort of approach. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a learning journey for us. You have different personas in the museum, uh, even in the the administration and management side of things. And you have people who are very pro-technology and people who are almost feeling that uh, it should all remain a physical experience. During COVID, everybody understood digital had to be it. Yeah. Uh, it was as we were coming out of COVID that the question uh, really became, hey, how much technology is the right amount of technology, yeah. right? And does technology lead or does the customer experience lead? Uh, and guess what? We ended up saying, hey, it has to be about art and the customer experience first. Uh, especially for us, we believe in the power of art physically. Yep. We have a large collection. Technology has to be an enhancement or an enabler or an amplifier, not the lead. So we're, we're very clear in our motto that we're not adopting technology for technology's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, we also make it uh, on demand, right? So you can go through the gallery completely with a physical experience, which is non-tech uh, related. Yeah. Uh, but if you want that, then there'll be points where you can switch on your phone and engage uh, in deeper learning, deeper content uh, through tech. Uh, so it's really up to the individual. Uh, again, because we're programming for a very diverse uh, group of people, including some who are less able right and mm -hmm. not able to access technology the use of technology in this space is unbelievable because it's it's, it's yeah. a great way to spark curiosity yep. and imagination uh in the non-art engaged you know yep. and non-art lover segment because frankly there's still a perception that art is for uh, those who are educated in art and we've done a lot of research that says hey what's the way in how do we uh, make it interesting for mm -hmm. people who are not uh, feeling like they're an art aficionado to engage with art. And technology always comes up as, hey, if you can present technology in a way that engages me in the platforms that I'm used to, I'm more open, right? But how we do that is uh, to focus on the experience. So sometimes we have a debate about, hey, should we go for all the bleeding edge technologies or should we adopt more mature, stable technology? And how much gadgetry do we want to get involved? You know, do we put on VR headsets? And, and I think we found that, it, that that sometimes gets in the way of the experience. It does spark that curiosity. It lowers the intimidation uh, with art. And that's why it broadens the appeal. I guess we look at it from three areas. Outreach. Technology also helps us to outreach beyond the museum. Uh, then engagement when they are in the museum or outside of the museum. And then there's a huge role that it can play in terms of education. Uh, because interestingly, in our museum, because the artworks are the central focus, the explanations of what the artwork, what the artist's intention was, you know, how the curators have gone about selecting the range of works, typically is quite minimalistic. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right? You have a very uh, brief and concise art, artwork label. Yeah. Uh, but again, I said at, on demand. So if you have a QR code next to that, if somebody wants to dive in more, they can. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's up to uh, the individual how much they want to engage with the physical artwork and the, the, the online content that we have. We did a thing during COVID for Indigenous art in Australia. Mm everything was remote. Yeah. It sounded an opportunity to try and use the metaverse yes. as an environment of setting up a gallery. I love the ability to allow people remotely to get yeah. access to things that they couldn't. So that, that was fantastic. Let's move on to artificial sure. intelligence. You're yeah. doing some exciting work and the proof of concept around an AI guide. We really needed to look at the end-to-end -end journey, right? Um, and with NCS, when we first started our partnership, uh, our we, instead of diving into tech, one of the first things we did was to map out that holistic end-to-end -end journey. And we've now realized that it's not about just a seamless journey, but a connected journey. Yep. Um, and one of the ideas that came out of that exercise was, hey, you know, magic happens when a visitor comes into the museum and they get a tour that's provided by our docent or our curator. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different experience than if you roam around the exhibition rooms by yourself. 
But what we realize is you cannot always access a docent or a curator, right? Because there are set timings for these tours. And the challenge that was put on the table is how can we provide our visitors every day at every time on demand a docent to guide you around? And that was when the idea of an AI guide was born. We do have self-guided audio tours already for many years since the beginning of the gallery that somebody can access on their app on their phone. Mm -hmm. But it's quite different, right? It's yeah. one way. It's not interactive. It's a bunch of uh, closed narratives and a very uh, uh, curated experience. Whereas with the docent the, and the curator, it's the exchange and the interaction that is a lot of the magic. Yeah. Uh, so we thought, how, how could we do that? And AI was ramping up and NCS was brave enough to say, hey, let's take this on. Let's take on an AI docent or AI guide um, and see how to make it work. Um, and so we, we put some effort into it and now we are in the final stages of a POC. Um, a lot of it was about um, training the AI. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part of it was about the experience. So we ended up with a audio enable experience. You could have your headphones and you could chat into your phone. Just have to be aware of the surroundings. So we also enable a text chat um, approach. Uh, but the biggest part of it was really content training of the AI. Uh, and given the line of work that we're in and we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're really educating the audience in the right way about art history, uh, balancing a closed and an open uh, LLL mo model mm -hmm. uh, to make sure we don't have hallucinations and uh, <laughs> uh, you know things that are in inaccurate from the internet being provided to the, to our visitors. Yep. And I must say we've come out with a very um, uh, uh, promising uh, solution. We're now looking at how to scale it um, to include the a sufficient number of artworks, uh, a sufficient enough uh, experience. So we're on the brink of operationalizing and rolling that out. And the magic is just that interaction. And you can literally feel like you're talking to someone. You can ask the guide anything uh, and get an answer that is coherent. Yeah. Um, right. And, and we're very excited about that because it's not bleeding edge tech. You don't have to put on, you know, uh, a Google Lens or, you know, a huge headset. Uh, it's simple, it's intuitive, but it adds value to the experience. I think that's what we're most excited about. And it can be personalized. You know, it's an elevated, next level, self-guided approach uh, where you can pick and choose how you want to have the guide uh, take you through. Uh, the most exciting prospect, I think, is if you put the right prompts on what you're interested in, you can create the itinerary yourself. You could even have a personalized exhibition delivered to you by the AI. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Right? Uh, we also did things with personas and language. Mm -hmm. So imagine you can have a docent who speaks Singlish uh, taking I was you around. just going to ask you, yeah. have, you got, have you used our Singlish model of it? Yes. Because we found well, that's one that, of the best things. Yeah. That's <laughs> obviously the benefit of working with NCS. <laughs> and that, that I think uh, in the user testing can. that we... Yeah, can. Very <laughs> good. Uh. Yeah. Good. Uh. The users were like, hey, I love this Singlish version. Yeah. You know, talk about making things accessible and inclusive, right? You don't yeah. have to have the Queen's English to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Or I mean, the we, King's English. We joke about it, but yeah. every dialect has a different version yes. and a personality and a way to interact. Absolutely. And if you don't get that right, you find that people find it harder to interact. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. if you do have the on the end of everything and it throws off the AI, yeah. then that's, it's not deliberate. It's yeah. just, that's what happens. Yeah. So what have you learned from the early learnings of the AI guide so far? The tech is always something you have to uh, work through. Uh, but I think it's how the user experience comes together, right? The, the interface, the usability, the intuitiveness of it. Uh, so a lot of this priming during the uh, training of the AI was about increasing sophistication of our responses, especially to all of these weird out of bound questions. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you'll be halfway through the tour and somebody says, what's for lunch? <laughs> How is the AI going to respond to that? It's yeah. to, oh, that's not in my toolkit. It feels very robotic and non-human, yeah. right? So yeah. how do you make that response as human as a docent would, would, would be? Yeah. Um, so we, we were thinking of how we can include, you know, our FMB uh, offerings in the museum to kind of 
point them towards uh, what they could have for lunch, uh, but also say, hey, you know, um, we can uh, satisfy your thirst for art or your appetite for art yeah. uh, by recommending uh, different experiences. Uh, so yeah, that human-centered uh, design is still one of the biggest learnings. Mm-hmm. Um, Tech is very exciting, but uh, how you apply it is is even more important. Yeah, I love the personality aspect of, yeah. um, of human centered design when it comes to AI. In fact, I saw something on Instagram the other day where someone had asked in their car. So it's AI. There's a lot of AI in new cars. So it was a Mercedes that said to the Mercedes, and it said, um, "Hey Mercedes, what do you think about BMW?" <laughs> <laughs> and the response back was fantastic. Came back and said, the same thing as you. That's why you're driving a Mercedes. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. But it just showcases personality and yeah. how that engages with yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which, is, which is really important. So when you ask someone, what do yeah. you want for lunch? You've got to have the right, you know, if you yeah. Yeah, you want to give someone a smile, right? Yeah. At the end of that response. Yeah. Not just feel like, oh, that's a, that's exactly. a machine. And it's just that little aspect of it the laugh just kind of gets people yes. feel it's not robotic it's, yes. it's fantastic yes. yeah what are some of the challenges you're facing at the moment around integrating technology and traditional art experiences and how they converge together a lot of the challenges were internal um, in the beginning right uh, mindset was a big uh, factor um, where we are traditionally about a physical art collection and the physical experience uh, and apart from the marketing and the IT folks who are linked into tech and how it can uh, be applied, we had to bring the rest of the organization with us. Um, so having a clear vision, a clear strategy, clarifying the role of technology was yeah. really important. Uh, and COVID, um, I think, helped us to leapfrog three to five years in that mindset paradigm change. Yeah. Uh, so that was an important first ingredient. Uh, the second part of it is uh, for the artworks in our region where our artists are typically younger than the Western world, uh, we still have many um, considerations with copyright and intellectual property rights that we have to be careful with. Um, mm-hmm. So the images can't just be applied f- as freely as some of the Western world artworks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is something we have to include in our contracts with the artists and the artist estates to include digital presentation as part of the rights. The good thing about this is it forces us to uh, continue to collaborate closely with the artists and the artist estates. If they're living artists, we work directly with the artists. Um, if they're not, then with the estates to make sure they're really comfortable and don't, they don't feel like we're just um, you know, propagating uh, their works in, um, in environments and platforms that they are not uh, comfortable with. And we never want to be in a position where we feel like um, the artist is feeling exploited or you know, uh, we've uh, misdirected how th- their original intention for the artwork was. So uh, it makes it a more uh, robust process. Uh, but it, I think when we look back, because we prioritize um, the, the, the interests of the artist, uh, it's a good thing that yeah. uh, we're forced to do that. And then finally, you know, capability building internally. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, let's be, <laughs> let's think about art and let's think about technology. How, how do you enable an organization um, to get their heads around it, right? Um, so clarifying vision, strategy, but also that whole um, kind of uh, design thinking, human-centered design, because uh, you don't want to apply tech for tech's sake. But how do you get that? Uh, uh, infused into almost um, the, the everybody in the gallery, right? So it's been a long process of really championing that, finding champions in the organization and enabling that. Um, and, and we kind of worked out that there are four or five factors that we need to look at, right? Having a clear vision, developing a culture of innovation and embracing technology, then having structure, process, and the right people. So putting all of that in place is necessary. Otherwise, the magic doesn't come together. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, down to recruiting the right type of folks. You know, So uh, when I took over the innovation and technology team, we had some pretty uh, important discussions around, hey, you know, one, you're not here to do keep the lights on tech. We are going to be about uh, digitalization and digital transformation. But again, it fits where it's not tech for tech's sake, it's tech as an enabler. Yeah. 
Yep. Uh, and getting our IT folks to switch from, hey, the tech is wonderful to, no, it's about the user experience. Uh, that's been a journey, a good journey. They've been very receptive, but uh, it takes quite a bit of um, you know, focused effort to drive that through. It's a fascinating world because we move more and more towards digital technology. Could technology become the art at some point in time? Many of the living and younger artists are already using technology as part of their artwork. It started way back many decades where video and moving images uh, are already part of um, the, the repertoire of our contemporary artists. Okay. Uh, and it's just going to get more. I mean, if you go to Singapore Art Museum, you will see artists working with generative AI, right? Um, now, of course, their take on it is slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. They look at the broader implications of AI, uh, as artists always do. But yeah, many of them are already working with NFTs, generative AI, you know, uh, large-scale displays. Some are delving into the metaverse already. For us uh, as a museum, our role is also to educate and to make it less scary for the artists and uh, encourage them to be uh, looking at the tech, but you know, taking their own uh, approach to how it makes sense for them in their practice. Yeah, NFTs are really interesting, and I think go through most people and technology people, they would have said at some stage they've explored an NFT in this space. Right? Yeah. You know, it's not just the LeBron James slam dunk that goes yeah. as an NFT, yeah. but it's an NFT for, you know, that, that goes with the original artwork. Yeah. Um, back to during COVID, we were looking at this indigenous gallery that we did in, mm. in the metaverse. One of the things we looked at was a NFT with the rights to the artwork. Yeah. Right. So that that could be intergenerational yeah. for, for artists as, you know, non-living artists as they go through it and yeah. making sure that goes back to the right place. NFTs yeah, I mean, yeah. there was a big NFT wave, as you know. Yeah. Um, so we had to make sense of it uh, and what our role in, in, in that would be as a public museum because we don't trade art, we don't uh, mm. sell art, um, right? So the first thing that we um, were committed to was, again, making sense of it and making sense of it for our museum, but also making sense of it for the artists, uh, particularly in our region. Mm -hmm. So they knew what it was, they knew how to use it, they knew uh, what could be the benefits, but also the pitfalls uh, surrounding it, right? And then we, we thought about, hey, is there really a role for us to play in the NFT game? Because we're not here for speculative trading, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yes, I think there are some aspects we are looking into, not just block, not just NFT, but blockchain itself, right? So for example, how can blockchain help with some way of, in the music industry, it was well known, digital rights management, yeah. right? Now, how do you uh, leverage that and apply it to the visual arts world? And yeah. we, we actually work with a partner uh, exploring how to do that exactly. We're taking baby steps uh, to make sure that we're comfortable because the digital rights part of it is not fully developed yet, yeah. right? And so there is still an instance where, hey, once you get an image, uh, you could still literally do anything with it. Yeah. And here we have to respect uh, the interests and the rights of the artist. Yeah. But that smart contract is a wonderful way to make sure the uh, royalties and the benefits go back to the artists, right? And we're a strong advocate for that. So we're more of an enabler at this stage. Uh, we're also looking at NFT in terms of how we could potentially use that for um, public access and ownership. So not for trading and value-driven, um, uh, uh, dollar value-driven exercises, but if we feel that we have a collection uh, that's a national collection that we want to spread into the arms of um, uh, Singapore residents. How can we give them a fractional ownership of that artwork, yeah. right? With the right model, with the right artists, and uh, with the respect that we need to uh, ensure. I like it because of the transparency of these technologies, but it's a governance that needs to come yes, in. Yes. Right. And once that comes in, it can be quite effective. So, yes. um, generative AI, mm. and, and you do obviously deal a lot with the artists. Do you see that as a risk or an opportunity? I think it's both. Yep. Um, you know, and, and you need to take a balanced view. Working closely with the artists is important because mm -hmm. uh, clearly, yeah, it brings up ethical, moral, um, you know, questions. A lot of the time, it's how we leverage the tech that is the difference between, hey, this is AI for good, 
or is it AI for exploitative reasons or is it going to have a negative impact on the workforce and the artists and the creative services, right? Um, and ideally, it should be uh, a tool to enable the artists to want to do what they do uh, at an elevated level, right? And, and like you said, if we put the right governance behind that, um, it, should, it should get to the right place. Uh, but you have to start with the right mindset to say, hey, we're doing this not to, um, yes, to make, it, make things easier for our users and our visitors, but we need to balance the interests of our stakeholders as well. There's so many different areas you can go into with generative yeah, AI. And we're and actually working yeah. uh, on, on a project yeah. where we're using generative AI and large-scale holographic display with yeah. a living artist and yeah. seeing how we can make that part of the experience for our visitors. Yeah. Right? So it's not that far away. It's actually right at our doorstep. Yeah. Um, but again, we're, we're putting effort into making sure the artist is completely involved in the process and she's driving how the experience uh, will be designed. And I presume the pace at which this moves, like we, we do this thing around technology and you look at how quickly technology advances and the last decade has had more change than the previous 200 years. Right? Yeah. And the speed of it and, and being able to keep up must be quite challenging to some extent. Uh, it's, it's challenging. I think, um, you know, it, it's really interesting. We, we have an innovation team at the gallery under my portfolio. Um, and it started out with uh, this team, you know, chasing, yeah. chasing all the technology trends and yeah. almost uh, trying out each and every trend that was emerging. And I think we've now reached a maturity to say, hey, um, we, we need to be more selective and choiceful. And a big part of that role is about sense making and choosing the right bets to make. And not everything is worth the same level of investment and effort. Uh, so we've developed a, a clear framework around that where we need to pause and evaluate and critically look at whether, you know, where in the maturity curve is this technology, yeah. right, before we chase after it. Yeah. Looking ahead, how yeah. do you envisage you know, the integration of new technologies and all these advancements changing the customer experience and the journey within and the visitor experience within the gallery? It's pretty clear that it's an integrated or hybrid, digital, hyper-real experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it should be as much or as little as the visitor would like it to be. That, that will guide us through. And it's just a case of then adopting the right technology to bring in to complement the experience. So as an experience enhancer and as, a, and as an experience amplifier, uh, it is here to stay. Uh, it's up to us to uh, make it make sense, make it reliable, make it robust, make it user-friendly. Let's not create another level of uh, barrier and intimidation with tech, right? We, we already need to lower the barriers for yeah. art appreciation. We won't, don't want tech to get in the way. But I, I do see that uh, it's here to stay. It's just a question of how we curate it to be uh, meaningfully integrated into the experience, right? And it's exciting times with all these large-scale interactive uh, display opportunities. Imagine if you couple all of these together, you know, holographic display, generative AI, metaverse, you know, streaming technology, blockchain. Uh, you could literally traverse uh, worlds uh, <laughs> physically, digitally in the museum, outside of the museum. It's, it's exciting and it's a great tool to, like I said, outreach, engage and educate. Yeah, I, lo I love watching the emergence of this. It's fantastic. As long as I don't see you know, 200 people walking around a gallery with the Apple Vision Pro on bumping yeah. into each other, no. I, think, I think we're in the right direction. But look, this has been an amazing conversation. No, thank and, you so much. And I'm very fortunate to have experienced some of these changes. I'm looking really forward yeah. to seeing how the experience changes over the time as yes. well. So, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for the time. If you found today's episode interesting and want to hear more about our Make Tomorrows, please subscribe to our channel.